Good morning and welcome to our Saviors Lutheran Church here in Stillwater, Minnesota. We are so glad you are joining us today and we have some exciting news. Many of you have been wondering when will the church have in-person gatherings for worship? And I'm happy to announce, keep these dates in mind. 7-11 on Wednesday, April 7th, will be the first in-person gathering for worship, limited to 160 people, so that we can still safe socially distance. And then also on Sunday, April 11th, at 10.30 a.m. for 160 people that you would sign up. And lots of details will be given in our weekly e-news this week. Uh, but for Holy Week, we also have some really exciting things planned with the worship committee. On Palm Sunday, which is just one week away, we will of course have our 9 a.m. online service for those that love to uh, have the online opportunity, that's totally great. And we will continue with the online option indefinitely at 9 a.m. But also at 10.30 on Palm Sunday, there will be an in-person gathering in our parking lot. We have a miniature donkey coming, yay, and a palm parade and some really exciting festive things to think about the special day when Jesus was parading through Jerusalem on a donkey. So you don't want to miss the donkey on Palm Sunday and the parade, um, and especially the, the outdoor worship. You can choose between sitting in your car and listening to the radio transmitter or sitting outside. And then again, on Easter at 9 a.m., there will be the online pre-recorded option, as well as an outdoor at 10.30 uh, worship service as well. And one of the reasons for that, with Palm Sunday and Easter, very big events in the church life, and we didn't want to have to have limitations of how many people could come. And so having it outdoors will be safer, and we're very excited about that. On Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, there will also be online worship at 7 p.m. that you can find on our, our Facebook page, our website, our YouTube page. And also, Good Friday, for those of you that have been missing being in the building in this past year, the worship committee has also designed something very special. You can choose be, any time between noon and six on Good Friday to come here to the church for a prayer vigil in the sanctuary or a Stations of the Cross interactive experience um, that is very family friendly in the CLC. Uh, it'll be a wonderful opportunity to pray, to reflect on what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And you will also have opportunities to sign up for that. And on that Good Friday, we will also be offering communion for those that will be participating for that time of prayer. So again, Palm Sunday, 9 a.m. online or 10.30 in the parking lot with a donkey and palm branches. Uh, Monday, Thursday, 7 p.m. Good Friday, 7 p.m. Both online worship experiences for those two evenings with the prayer vigil in the sanctuary or Stations of the Cross in the CLC from noon until six. And then Easter, 9 a.m. is online and 10.30 in the parking lot. And for those of you excited about the in-person gathering for worship, again, that will begin on Wednesday, April 7th, and then Sunday, April 11th. And of course, we will monitor things and we know there's variants out there. And so this is the current recommendation from the resurrection team that has been approved by the board. And on that note, let's begin now with our confession of sin and God's forgiveness to us. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. 
Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, our saviors, and welcome to worship this Sunday morning. Please join us in our opening song as we sing Rescue.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Before the Israelites left Babylon, the king of Persia, who had overthrown Babylon, decided to help them rebuild the temple back in Jerusalem. He organized people from all over the land to give livestock and supplies to the Israelites. He even returned all of the gold and silver that the Babylonians had stolen from the temple. 50,000 Israelites returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the altar of the temple then laid the foundation for the building itself. Before the temple was even finished, the Israelites began to offer sacrifices and worship God in it once again. But other countries surrounding Jerusalem began to worry about the Israelites regaining power. So they sabotaged the rebuilding project and it came to a standstill for 16 years. But God used two men, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage the Israelites to resume building the temple and not to be afraid of their enemies. So they continued building, strengthened by the prophet's words. The opposition continued, this time from a man named Tatanai, the governor of a nearby region. He wanted to stop the Israelites from building and worked to convince the Persian king, Darius, to stop the Israelites. Not only did King Darius not stop the rebuilding project, he threatened Tatanai and anyone else who would try to stop the temple from being rebuilt, that he would kill them. Then he made Tatanai give funding, animals, and supplies to the Israelites. So the work continued, and almost 70 years after it had been destroyed, the Israelites finished rebuilding the temple. They dedicated it by sacrificing hundreds of animals to God and returning the priests back to their positions of leadership in the temple. God was once again worshipped in Jerusalem. Dear friends in Christ, let's begin this time together in a prayer. Wonderful God, we are so grateful that you are faithful that you have led us through this past year with all of its uncertainty and all of its struggles and all of the emotions that we've maybe experienced in this past year. We know you're a faithful God that will also lead us well into the future and you promise to be with us every moment in this present moment too. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your love, for your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we are on chapter 19 of the story, a narrative rendition of the Bible where we've been studying excerpts of the Bible in 31 chapters and now today chapter 19 is titled The Return Home after years of being in Babylon in captivity the Israelites will finally get to go home. So when I say the word home, what kind of words come to mind for you? 
Whenever I hear the word home, I think of my mom and dad. And in particular, I think of the words loved and known, safe and secure. Let me explain. When I was a kid growing up in a small town and a parsonage, my dad was a pastor, my mom was a homemaker, there was always something that I could count on, is that if I were, were at a friend's house or, or later in life, um, even when we moved to new communities, one thing I could always count on was that my mom would always be home. She was, you know, enjoying life and, and building this beautiful home for us. And so, if ever I was calling home, my mom would answer the phone in her gentle, sweet voice, and she would say, hello, ha Hagens. And she is just one of the kindest and dearest souls. So when I think of home, I think of my mom's voice, hello, ha Hagens, knowing that I'm loved and that I'm known. I also think of a, a very happy childhood memory of safety and security that my dad, being a pastor, he would often be quite busy ministering, but one time of the day that was very sacred to him was Sunday afternoons. And that was the time where he would have the most reverent pastor's nap. He would be watching Star Trek reruns on the television in the TV room, and he'd be lying on a couch with his knees that would pop out on the second cushion. And for us, when we were growing up, my brothers and I, we would always fight over who could sit in that little spot, that little crevice that my dad would have on the couch. We called it the nest. We knew that we were safe, we were secure in that place. But for me, I've always loved church. I could never sit still. Taking a nap on a Sunday afternoon was the last thing I ever wanted to do. And even Brian could joke, my husband, that I'm not a very good napper. I like to keep going and moving. And so even as a youngster, I would, I would get up from the nest and I would try to, to pull my dad's hand and wake him up and, and say, Dad, come on, let's go play. Let's, let's shoot some hoops and play basketball or, or, or do something fun. And, and he would always just lay there on the couch wanting to try to take some nap and some time of rest and renewal. And I would pull him away, but he was so much stronger that he would pull me back to him. And then we'd giggle about it. And eventually he let me run off and play as long as I didn't disturb him. So for me, when I think of the word home, I usually think of my mom and dad where I'm loved I'm known, I'm safe, I'm secure. But I don't know if that's always a universal experience, unfortunately. In this past year, many of us have maybe spent a lot of time at home, maybe a little too much time at home, that rather than feeling loved, maybe some of us have felt unloved in the sense of isolation and far from human connection that we're used to. Maybe rather than feeling known, we feel unknown with the virtual world and it's easy to feel lost and forgotten. And for unfortunately, for many in our country and in the world over, instead of feeling safe, there's maybe the feeling of unsafe, where there's abuse and hunger and uncertainty and stress. And instead of security, maybe insecurity, with housing, um, maybe housing issues and unemployment and mental health on the rise and racial injustices. It's been a tough time. Now we are, a year later, with unexpected, incredible blessings of promise of grace that seems to be piercing through the clouds where, where I've seen pictures and commentary of, of people returning to that sense of love, of visiting grandkids for the first time in a year, of feeling known again, of, of having meaningful conversations with people, of feeling safer, maybe not quite entirely safe, but knowing that vaccines are being rolled out and maybe even security might be returning as well with that hope and that desire and that longing for in-person worship that we plan to begin in April. 
But I can only imagine what it must have been like for the Israelites. We've had one year of just really feeling lost and overwhelmed and stressed the whole world over. But what about for the people of Israel who had been in captivity for 70 years? who had really no sense of of feeling loved. Last week, we talked about the book of Daniel and and how unsafe they were and how how incredibly cruel they were by putting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace and Daniel in a lion's den. That is far from safe and secure. And they probably felt like fish out of water in a different culture, in a different place, where their beliefs, their religion, their everything about them, their identity was completely different than everybody else around them. And they must have felt just alone. But in unexpected grace, maybe even more so than even a a miraculous vaccine within a year, a miraculous, unexpected grace that King Darius The Persian king that would overtake the Babylonians would say, "Eh, let's let these Israelites go home finally. And not only that, let's restore their fortunes. And not only that, let's ensure that they can rebuild their temple and have a safe place to worship God. That's pretty miraculous that this foreign king would set the people free would allow them to return home. And then again, it would take another 70 years to rebuild this temple of worship. And even with a 16 year um, halt and, and, and Haggai and Zechariah prophets that would come to encourage, finally, that temple was rebuilt and hope was restored, but not completely. Because you see, the people were still longing for a king. They were still longing for a leader, for a savior, for a Messiah, an anointed one who would come, Jesus. And what's interesting is that Jesus, when, when we're discovering the, the beautiful, powerful stories of his life on earth, Jesus had once said when he was looking at the temple, <laughs> a place of worship in Jerusalem, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. People were scratching their heads. What in the world is Jesus talking about? It took 70 years to rebuild this temple, and you're claiming that within three days, you're going to let this temple rise again? But of course, Jesus was referring to his own body that he would go to the cross, that he would suffer and die and rise again. And when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, blessing them with communion, washing their feet, he assured them that he would not leave them orphaned, that he would send the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the advocate, to be there with them, to walk with them. And of course, Jesus, after he did rise from the grave, he came back to that upper room and he breathed the Holy Spirit on the disciples, empowering them to be God's presence in the world. Jesus was reminding us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of the living God lives within us. I've always loved this quote by St. Augustine that says, my soul is restless until it finds its rest in God. My soul is restless until it finds its rest in God. When I was a little kid and I left the nest, this place of comfort and security, I didn't always appreciate just that moment of being still, of of knowing that I was loved and safe and secure and home. And as I would pull on my dad's hand and he would draw me close and it was just this tug of war game. I've had my dad on my mind a lot lately as he's undergoing some health concerns. 
but he assured me, he said, Karna, I am at peace. And I remembered that when I was discerning a call to be a missionary in India and Nepal when I was 23 years of age, my dad had said, Karna, there is no safer place to be than in the center of God's hands. And that's where you always are. You're always in God's hands. As we think about the incredible opportunity to regather in person safely, and there'll be guidelines for that of, of what that will look like that the resurrection team has created. There's also the reminder today that we can always be at home with the Lord. That as St. Augustine said, that my soul is restless until it finds its rest in you, that the spirit of the living God lives within us, that we can experience peace, we can experience that being loved and known by our creator, being safe and secure, even as simply as paying attention to our breath and slowing down and spending time in prayer. I'm excited. I'm excited for what the future holds for our saviors, for all of us. God is faithful. And God has led us through this, this difficult time, and now we're going into a hybrid model of worship of in-person and online. But I know that God is a God of love and grace and compassion and will continue to be faithful to all of us, even to the end of the age. May you trust and know that God is with you on your journey and that you can feel at home at any time with the Lord. God bless. Amen. We appreciate your offerings and support of our continuing ministry at Our Savior's Lutheran Church, a caring community called by Christ to serve and live in faith. Contributions can be made by check, text, online, or mobile app. For details, please see Donate on our website at oslcstillwater.org. Thank you for sharing from the abundance with which God has blessed you. And now for the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all people in need. You wash us through and through and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Through them, show the world of new possibilities. Bless ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence. And you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds. Protect all from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence. Those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who are in need of healing of mind or body, and those who are dying and all those who grieve. We pray especially for Jack Mears, Annie Crewson, Chuck Pienaard, Catherine Solheim, 
Anne Plant, Owen Nelson, Sandy Hewitt, Wayne Longstrat, Jack Davis, Larry Tosseth, Susan Severson, Britta Dunke, Terry McLaren, Linda Thomas, Elaine Mingle, Joyce Middlesid, Merle Smith, Doris Wallama, Jean Loudon, Pat Thorson, Allison Kirk, Tracy Saunders, Barry Zimdars, Ray Vaughn, Bob Burns, Diane Sage, Jeanette, Lalo Cheetah, Emma Smaker, Brittany and her brother Jimmy, Doris Nolan, Anna Marie Mitchell, Baby Zeke, Baby Sylvie, and Barb Russell and her family as her father Jerry Neely has entered hospice care. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for our mission partners locally, regionally, and globally, including the Anawik community, Open Hands Midway, Mlafu, Tanzania, Mission Jamaica, Zacaleu, Guatemala. Bless all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they may also feel energized, engaged, and equipped to receive your grace and share your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Jesus calls us to follow him in life and death. Empower this congregation in discipleship. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school, confirmation and learning ministries. Give us your truth and wisdom and teach us to follow Jesus. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us words to worship you. With all those who have died in Christ, bring us into life everlasting. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you. O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus took bread. And when he had given it to his disciples, he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. You will see a hand reach out and let this represent you the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We have many birthdays and anniversaries this week at Our Savior, so I'd like to acknowledge the birthdays of Lainey Hansen, Elaine Hagerness, Alec Hill, Kristen Kaufman, Marcus Kaufman, Elena Reim Schneider, Charlotte Schuld, Lila Janet, Joseph Leish, Adeline Perkins, Will Janet, Casey Larson, Joseph Marcus, Carrie Steinke, Jim Ulrich, Noah Kasky, Kathy Frost, Riley Eviota, Michelle Gregg, Thomas Blair, Donna Sloan, Ben Stoffer, and Elena Clark. So happy birthday to all of you. And anniversaries include Daryl and Sylvia King, Joe and LaVon Marcus, Susan and Richard Oberg, and Susan Oberman and Doug Smith. So happy anniversary to all of you. At this time, we join together in singing with Pastor Keith in the Christ, cross of Christ I glory. In the cross of Christ I glory towering o'er the wrecks of time all the light of sacred stars. 
make me hopes deceive and fears annoy. Never shall the cross forsake me. Lo, it glows with peace and joy. May the Lord, mighty Lord, bless and keep you forever. Grant you peace, perfect peace, courage and every God's face and God's grace forever. May the Lord, mighty Lord, bless and keep you forever. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.